child dead, her brother, the prime suspect. They made an arrest in the case. And I said, who is it? They said, we've arrested your son. Police interrogated Michael Crow for 12 hours over three days without his parents and without a lawyer. Once a police officer decides to do an interrogation, there's one goal only, and that is to get a confession. But how far will police go to get that confession? And what are the rights of parents and children? January 21st, 1998. In the San Diego suburb of Escondido, California, 12-year-old Stephanie Crow is found stabbed to death in her own bedroom. Stephanie was full of life. From the moment she woke up till she went to sleep, she was busy doing things. And she always gave 100%. Five feet tall and brown-haired, Stephanie Crow was a girl who loved the Spice Girls and the movie Titanic. In her spare time, she was a member of her church choir, and worked as a volunteer at the Escondido Library. Now, she lies lifeless on the floor of her room, 10 feet from her bed. One of her books, a mystery novel, lies under her right foot. It's entitled, The Twisted Window. The victim was found by her grandmother after the grandmother was awakened by the alarm clock in the victim's bedroom. When Judith Kennedy found her granddaughter lying on the bedroom floor, she yelled, awakening Stephanie's parents. Then, her dad called for help. Hey, daughter. What's the problem? She laid on the floor. She stopped breathing. We blow all over the place. Please, oh, we got to help her. My daughter's dead. Police and paramedics arrive. They strain to pull Cheryl Crow away from her daughter's body. The body appears to have suffered several stab wounds. Police determine the little girl is dead. Her family's home is now a crime scene. And they asked me who would want to hurt her, and I said, there's no one, I wouldn't know anyone that was, she's 12 years old. Police find no evidence that an intruder entered the home, no broken locks, windows, or doors. There are several sliding track doors around the house. One of them opens into the parents' bedroom, and these doors will had been left unlocked. But police don't think an intruder could have entered this way, quietly and undetected, without clattering the vertical blinds behind the door. They pretty much herded us into the living room. They, they got everyone and, and had us sitting on the, the couch. Wouldn't let us really, you know, move or nothing. While Escondido police secure the family's house, Stephanie's parents, siblings, and grandmother are all taken to police headquarters to be questioned. I asked them not to separate the kids. I said, that it, you know, to at least let them be with either Cheryl or Cheryl's mom, and they promised me that they would not separate the kids from us. At first, detectives focus on Stephanie's father, Steve Crow, a 35-year-old auto body painter. Is it possible that this devoted dad, nearly hysterical when he called 911, could have molested his daughter and then killed her to hide the fact? Authorities in Escondido declined to talk to us about the ongoing investigation, so we talked with Luis Garcella, a former New York City homicide detective who once lived in Escondido. 911 callers have been convicted of murder many times. Um, you don't want to rush in. You want to take a good look at the big picture, and certainly with regards to the mom and the dad. Scarcella has investigated over 250 homicides, and the cases in which a child was found dead at home teach a lasting lesson. I believe I had about nine or 10 that fell in that category. And in every one of those murders, it was always a relative, possibly a brother or a um, stepdad, someone who was in the house. Each of us were separated in our own little rooms and with, it, with nothing but just another policeman or cop sitting there staring at us the whole time. And we were there all day. They informed me that they were gonna take pictures of us and take our clothes for evidence. And I wasn't too happy about that because they said that they were going to photograph us naked. I take a good look at their bodies, their hands, their arms, their whole bodies, because individuals who inflict X amount of stab wounds cut themselves. 
While the Crow family is being questioned, police are also busy scouring the crime scene for clues. Pools of blood are visible at the foot of Stephanie's bed and near her door. Several hairs are found lodged in the ring on Stephanie's right hand. Investigators think these resemble those of the victim's 14-year-old brother, Michael. Police also find something more. The words, kill, kill, penciled on a windowsill. The medical examiner estimates the murder occurred sometime after 9.30 Tuesday night or early Wednesday morning. The autopsy also reveals Stephanie was stabbed eight times. We have not located a weapon at this time, and there's a pretty extensive search being conducted at the residence. Back at the police station, Cheryl and Steve Crow and their surviving children are in the midst of a 15-hour ordeal. The cop came back in and said that they're taking the kids away from us. And they're going to put them in, they're taking them and putting them in protective custody. Well, that, at that point, I had, I had enough and I, I just, I threw a fit. The kids were crying and they were upset and I just said, well, it's going to be okay. These are the good guys. They're here to help us, like we've taught them their whole lives. Um, and I just hugged them and told them I, we'd get them as soon as we could. And then I had to leave. They took Michael and his little sister Shannon away from the family at the time the murder was discovered and put them in a, uh, the Polinsky Center for Children, which is uh, basically a receiving facility for abused children. Here in Escondido, California, the specter of the Jean Benet Ramsey murder two years before in Boulder, Colorado, still looms like an unwelcome visitor. They kept saying to each one of us, it's not gonna be another John Benet Ramsey, it's not gonna be another O.J. Simpson case. They told us that day that we weren't under arrest and that we can leave, leave at any time. So after they'd taken the kids away, I said, well, then let's go, because I'm, I'm through with this, this is ridiculous. So we walked downstairs to the police department, and the second we touched the, the, the glass doors to, to exit, they were locked. But the second we did that, there was cops coming out of the woodwork and, with their guns drawn on us. And the one detective, Detective Risley, standing there with his gun pointed at my chest, yelling at us, get back upstairs. And I'm thinking, you know, what is this guy? He's nuts. So we, we, we complied with him and went back upstairs. Escondido authorities deny this confrontation took place. By 10 p.m. Wednesday, the Crows are finally allowed to leave the station. Meanwhile, their children Shannon and Michael are being looked after at the county shelter. Michael, first of all, here's this poor kid who's emotionally distraught because his sister was murdered. He doesn't even have the adults in his life to comfort him. Nobody endeavored to give him any therapy or anything. And soon, detectives shift their attention from Stephanie's father to her brother, Michael. In fact, since the first hours of the investigation, when detectives arrived at the murder scene, they had suspicions about the teenager, because Michael seemed much less emotionally distraught than the rest of the family. Police noticed the youngster sitting on the couch, playing with a handheld video game. I want to zero in on that kid. I would look at that very carefully, because to me as an investigator, that did uh, it would mean something, yes. Police are troubled by Michael's claim that he woke up at 4.30 that morning, went from his room to the kitchen, right past his sister's bedroom, but never saw her lying dead in the doorway. This 14-year-old now becomes the sole focus of their investigation and their prime suspect. He is brought back for further questioning. I'm kind of thinking, you know, why I'm, I'm speaking to you. I guess. Okay. But what started out as a murder mystery is about to become something else. A revealing look at the power that our justice system can bring to bear to get a confession, even from a 14-year-old. Most citizens would find it very scary to be taken into custody at all to a police station, even if totally innocent. And imagine that, like Michael Crow, you are 14 years old, being questioned about the stabbing death of your younger sister without your parents or a lawyer present. Uh, I'll tell you what, Mike, why don't you have a seat in that little chair over there? Interrogation is a very unpleasant experience. It is deliberately designed to be intimidating. It is deliberately designed to make you acutely aware of the power of the state and the power of the police officers. Confession was for centuries considered the, the queen of proofs. After all, what's, what seems like more probative evidence than what a person says with his or her own lips? My main objective is to get them to say that I pulled the trigger 
that I stabbed the individual numerous times, that I strangled this individual. Sometimes we don't get that, but we get enough to put them in the soup. I'd like to tell you what, the, uh, what your rights are. Uh, you have a right to remain silent. You understand that? Even though suspects don't really have to answer questions, most do. Now, over 80% of criminal suspects do waive their Miranda rights. We all subscribe to the notion that silence equals guilt, right? That if you're, if you're innocent, if you've got nothing to hide, then you're not going to remain silent. If you can't afford an attorney, you won't be appointed for you free of charge. All parents ask their children to fess up when they've done something wrong. If they don't confess, then it's a sign that they're really obstinate, recalcitrant, maybe bad people. Do you have any idea who may have wanted to harm your sister? No. If you had anything to do with it, would you tell me? Yes. Police are allowed to question a juvenile without a parent being present, as long as the child clearly understands his Miranda rights and has agreed to waive them. But if a child asks to see a parent, the police must comply with that request. There would be no reason for your hair to be in Stephanie's room. She was found for that. After 14 minutes of questioning Michael, Detective Clater leaves the room and his suspect alone. I want to take a good look and see what they're doing, to observe, let them collect their thoughts, take a good look at them. It helps sometimes. It, it helps. Seven minutes later, Detective Clater returns and seems a lot more impatient with Michael. We're, we're really trying to believe what you say. We want to believe what you say. Uh, would you have any problems with taking a, a truth verification in this? None at all? Do you act like there's a question? I've told some people I would not mind. What's the problem, Mike? I spent all day away from my family. I couldn't see them. I, I feel like I'm being treated like I killed my sister. And I didn't. And it feels horrible. Detective Clater tells Michael he's not blaming anyone and wants to believe him. Again, he leaves. And once more returns minutes later, this time with Officer Chris McDonough. And they can, of course, use the, the, the Mutt and Jeff uh, good cop, bad cop routine. Uh, one cop uh, leaves the interrogation room and the other says, Now, I'm with you on this. I don't think you're really guilty. You know I'm a pretty good guy. You can obviously sense that. I mean, I'm not, not hitting you with a rubber hose, am I? Okay, and there's no Detective McDonough, myself. who has a son Michael's age, devotes the next half hour trying to bond with his 14-year-old murder suspect, posing more relaxed questions about school, friends, and computer games. I'm here to verify what you're saying, okay? Um, we're going to work through this together, okay? Okay. Um, I can tell you, this is this instrument here okay, is what they call a computer voice stress analyzer. Now you'll appreciate this being into computers. This thing purports to tell the difference between the truth and a lie. The computer voice stress analyzer is a lie detector device introduced in 1988. Its manufacturer, the National Institute for Truth Verification, claims it is almost foolproof, cheaper and easier to use than a polygraph. Its accuracy rate is phenomenal, okay? And that's what makes it such a great tool. The device works on the theory that the voice emits inaudible vibrations called micro tremors, which can be measured on a graph. Under stress, when a person lies, for example, their vocal muscles tighten and cause a decrease in the tremors. A truthful response tends to look like a Christmas tree. A deceitful response is more squared off. However, independent studies of the stress analyzer's accuracy do not inspire much confidence. The result of these studies was that the reliability of the machine was less than a coin flip in determining deception. Yet the device does give police one more way to approach or perhaps intimidate a suspect. When we showed Detective Lou Scarcella the interrogation tape, he was much more familiar with the strategy than he was with the machine. 
I personally thought it was a ruse. Using uh, a tool to deceive the individual, which is beautiful as far as I'm concerned, I had no idea what this machine was. Yeah. Okay. Before giving the truth verification yeah. test, this Detective McDonough actually you know, works together with Michael to formulate the questions. What are, what are some things we want to learn here, do you think? If I know who did it, if I did it, okay, well, let's, let's, let's do that then. Do you know who, uh, let's say, took Stephanie's life? Yeah. Okay, would that be a good, fair question? Yes. Okay, do you know who took? Do you know how she died? No. Soon the test questions are agreed upon, and McDonough asks Michael to sign a form declaring he's about to take the test voluntarily. So you don't realize what's happening. You've now been sucked into a process, and that process is going to roll forward for as long as you let it roll forward. So Michael's interrogation continues, all the while his parents assume he's being looked after at a children's shelter, unaware he is in police custody. They just kept grilling and grilling and grilling, and to think that we were at home not even knowing he was near the police station. If we would have known, we would have been there. Now, however, Michael seems almost relieved to be cooperating and submits readily to the voice stress analyzer. Are you sitting down? Yes. Do you know who took Stephanie's life? No. Yeah. Today, Thursday? Yes. Did you take Stephanie's life? No. Eight minutes later, the truth exam is complete. Let me uh, go over these charts and I'll be back here in a couple minutes, okay? Yeah. When we come back, what will the voice stress exam reveal? It is 4 p.m. Thursday, January 22nd, 1998, and 14-year-old Michael Crow of Escondido, California, is in the midst of a four-hour interrogation at police headquarters without an attorney or his parents present. His younger sister Stephanie was found murdered at home the day before, and investigators suspect Michael may be involved. He has just completed a voice stress exam. Yes. Now, Detective Chris McDonough returns with the results. What did you think? What were your thoughts through the whole thing? I don't know. Nervous. Nervous? Okay, let's go over that. What were you nervous about? I don't know. It, it might be wrong. Okay, in what way? And it might say I, I did kill Stephanie. Okay, and why would it say that? I don't know, because everyone's already treating me like that. Oh. And I can understand your feelings there, okay? I mean, you're 14 and you've been through a lot, okay? <clears throat> but this instrument doesn't know you, does it? No. Science is in our favor, okay? Technology's on our side. Okay? I mean, can you understand that? The detective shows Michael the charts of his performance on the so-called truth exam. They indicate he lied when he answered no to question 12, do you know who took Stephanie's life? Maybe there's something we need to understand about Michael and about your sister that we didn't understand and maybe somebody could have helped. It's okay. It's okay to feel the way you feel. I really okay, but I don't know. I don't know why I'd say that. I, I swear, I swear to God, I don't know. But the police think they know. Their theory on this second day of the investigation is that a very smart, very lonely, and very angry Michael Crow stabbed his sister to death. His likely motive, a rage-fueled case of sibling rivalry. I'm looking at you right now, okay, and inside you're about ready to burst. We can't bring her back. She's gone, okay? You're fighting it. You're, you're, you're... I don't know what to do anymore. I understand. <laughs> now I'm being told that I'm lying. I'm, I'm not, not saying... Lying. Michael, I'm not saying that. Have you heard me say that? What if they come back and say to you, Michael, we have your hair. While the search for truth is at the heart of the interrogation process, the police are not required to tell the truth. They can use false uh, polygraph lie detector test results to say your polygraph showed you were guilty when that was not the case. And this is all considered legitimate um, interrogation tactics. As far as I'm concerned, there are no rules with homicide. With homicide. No rules. You have to stay within the law. You have to be aware that people have rights. 
but there are no rules. And yes, we can use deception. I think many of the American public would be, would be surprised and shocked by this. They're allowed to lie uh, to their suspect. Um, courts have allowed them to lie. They say, Michael, we have your hair in her hand. And all of a sudden, you go, now what? I mean, what are you going to do at that point? I mean, at I that, that point, point. I, would, I would do a complete white out and get him not knowing it. I mean, just, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> could that have happened? No, not that I know of. <laughs> not that you know of. I, like I said, I would have to be completely unaware of it. Okay. Have you ever blacked out before? No, never. Okay, I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> if I knew who did it, you would know. Everyone would know right now. Okay, why? Because I just remember who did it. I, if I ever find out, I'll hate them forever. I love them. Soon after, Michael Crow once again is left alone. The next thing is to convince the person that their situation is hopeless. They can say that there was evidence found at the scene of the crime, yeah. blood, semen, whatever, uh, that points to the, the suspect. Now, Ralph Clater, the lead detective on this homicide case, an investigator with 23 years of experience, returns with his tough, less patient style and more false evidence. You know, there's a lot of blood. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. You mean stay with me, Michael. It's very difficult for the person who did it not to not to, to get blood on them. Yeah. Okay. And not to transfer that blood to other parts of the house. Yeah. We found blood in your room already. God. You're talking to a 14-year-old kid. Wasn't it possible that the did turn up in the room? What is that telling the kid? I better confess to this. We use we use processes called. Where'd you find it? Pardon me. Where'd you find the blood? I'm sure you, you know. What? God, I don't. I no. I don't know. I didn't do it. Does that mean you can't tell me about the knife? I don't know what we're talking about. Okay. I don't know what we're talking about. You're 14? Yes. You got your whole life ahead of you, don't you? Yeah. At that point, he's being, you know, know accused of the unthinkable. He's being accused of murdering his own sister. And he's insisting, look, I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But they wouldn't take no for an answer. God. Oh, God. You tell me. Why are you doing this to me? If I did this, I don't remember it. I don't okay. remember the thing. I... And you know what? That's possible. <laughs> like many boys his age, 14-year-old Michael Crow spent much of his free time playing video games. Very often, perhaps too often, he was alone in his room, absorbed by the violent imagery. On Friday, January 23, 1998, Michael Crow once again enters the all-too-real world of a murder investigation where he is seen as the demon. With advice from a psychologist, detectives Ralph Clater and Mark Risley confront their teenage suspect with the theory that there may be two Michaels. And now they need the good Michael to help them expose the bad one. You're a child. You're 14 years old. Nobody's going to hold you to the same standards that they would some criminal on the street. Okay? You're going to need some help through this. One way to get this help, detectives suggest, is for Michael to write a letter to his dead sister asking for her forgiveness. Outstanding tool. I never used the letter, but I have 
used other emotional tools. Tools like this one that tend to ease a suspect's burden of guilt. Left alone in the interrogation room for the next 24 minutes, here is some of what Michael Crow writes to the sister the police believe he killed. Dear Stephanie, they are putting me through hell, and I think that's what I deserve. If I did do this, then I am insane. The only way I know I did is because they told me I did. I want you to know that I was not myself when I did this. When detectives Clater and Risley return, they focus on the words in Michael's letter that, for the very first time, speak of his guilt. They push him for details of the killing, asking him which parts of his sister's body he might have stabbed in order to kill her. God. But making Michael remember is exactly what investigators are here to do. They tell him he faces two paths. If he doesn't talk and the case against him is made without his help, he'll go to jail. But if he does provide details, he can help in return. And you have my personal guarantee that the help you need to accept this is going to be forthcoming. That is what the system is geared for. I want to go down that path. No, no, no. Cut, cut it out. Cut it out, Mike. Cut it out. The reason I'm sounding impatient, Mike, is the 11th hour is rapidly approaching. All this evidence is going to be in. Rush on some things that, quite frankly, is going to bury you, my friend. And you need to head that off at the pass. You need to take the step over here first the hit with this avalanche. But at this point, the police do not have any such avalanche of evidence. They're bluffing Michael, and he falls for it. Like I have this overwhelming feeling that I killed her, but... Okay, let's, let's hear... Let me hear about... Let me hear about... I don't know why I feel that way. Let me hear about... The pressure to get him to talk is working, yet he insists that the only details he can give them are ones he'll have to make up. But it will... I'll lie. I'll have to make it up. Tell the story. Right. The autopsy report has already shown that Stephanie Crow was stabbed eight times. The questioning is now in its fourth hour, but what happens in the next few minutes will prove to be more critical than anything Michael has said so far. The teenager accepts the detective's offer to end the day's session and be taken back to the children's shelter, where he's been staying since his sister's murder two days before. While the camera continues to record the empty room, Michael exits with the detectives, who continue talking with him elsewhere in the station house. They tell Michael he is under arrest for killing his sister. According to police, Michael responds flatly, I thought so. I really didn't like her anyway. But he and his father insist there's a whole other side to the story. They took him off camera. He wanted to see us. And what they told him was that your parents you know, know that you murdered their daughter and they don't want to have nothing to do with you no more. They hate you. We're the only ones that you have now. And they bring him back on camera and his demeanor changed. He seems much calmer, almost relieved, and much more forthcoming. Because now Michael's trying to please the, pe the only people he thinks he has left. Hey, she loves me. She made me feel worthless. For the first time, the 14-year-old reveals resentment toward his parents and the favoritism they showed the victim, his younger sister Stephanie. And she was like a threat to me. Everything I did, she could match. That wasn't right. Michael says he feels as if there are three people inside him, and one of them is evil. I was in my own world. I let my body take over. 
But through the final hour of questioning, he never does provide police with a single accurate detail of how he stabbed his sister to death. Yet Michael is charged with murder and taken off to a juvenile prison. At home, his parents receive a very unexpected call. 12.30 at night, we got a call from the police station, and it was Detective Sweeney saying that they made an arrest in the case. They arrested the murderer of our daughter. And I said, who, who was it? Who is it? And they said, we've arrested your son. We thought he'd done it. I mean, because at that point, because when a police officer tells you that someone did something, you think that they, they did it. I mean, we had trust in police up until this point. The first thing I asked Michael when he got on the phone was, did you, did you have anything to do with this? Did you, did you murder Stephanie? And he said, I don't know, Dad. They keep telling me I did it, but I don't know. When we return, police report they've found the murder weapon and Michael's accomplices. A week after the murder of 12-year-old Stephanie Crow, family and friends grieve at her funeral. Her brother Michael, however, cannot attend. He is locked away in juvenile hall, charged three days earlier with stabbing her to death. It's a crime, police tell his parents, that Michael confessed to. Why would Michael murder his sister? I mean, there was never, there, they had never fought. There was never any, you know, what they, the police called intense sibling rivalry. The night before, Michael had helped her with her homework. They were lying on the floor, sharing a pillow, watching TV together. It just didn't make sense to me. And now the case takes an even stranger turn. Three days after Michael Crow is charged with killing his sister, Detectives visit the home of his best friend, Joshua Treadway. They find a knife under the 15-year-old's bed, one that he stole from another friend. The police think it's the type of knife that could have been used to kill Stephanie Crow. Convinced that he is involved in the murder, police bring Josh in for questioning. The evidence is not screaming at all. What do I do with Josh? I charge Josh with the murder of 12-year-old Stephanie Ann Crow. That's the only option I have. Why? Josh had the murder weapon. Over the next 12 hours, until 8 the next morning, police interrogate Josh the same way they did Michael, alone, without a lawyer. Josh's father is on hand and does get a chance to comfort his son. But for the most part, he allows detectives to interrogate Josh in his absence. They lied to him about evidence. They made express and implied promises of leniency. Um, they didn't feed him, they um, didn't let him use the men's room very frequently, they deprived him of sleep, they did everything that you're really not supposed to do. Josh is shaken. He knows Michael has already been arrested, and the cops are also talking to his friend Aaron Hauser, the original owner of the knife. We talked in depth with Michael. We talked in depth with Aaron. Who's to say they're not blaming you for this whole thing? That's why I'm afraid of. Okay, oh wait, stop. Despite this ordeal, Josh admits nothing and is free to leave the station house. Two anxious weeks later, he is called back in for a second session with police. By now, he's a nervous wreck, especially when he is led to believe his friends have set him up as the fall guy. Only then does Josh spell out his story. He was only the lookout in this violent crime, he tells police. It was his friends who killed 12-year-old Stephanie. I knew that Michael was supposed to go in there and sort of take care of keeping Stephanie quiet. Mm -hmm. And Aaron was supposed to go over and take care of the business. It was going to happen. And I was going to dispose of the knife when it was done. Michael came back a little while after that, and he was rinsing the knife in the sink. Within a day, 15-year-olds Josh Treadway and Aaron Hauser are also arrested and charged with Stephanie's stabbing death. They join Michael in Juvenile Hall. Just as quickly, when all three teenagers are finally lawyered up as police would, there's no great surprise when they deny their confessions. People are always like, oh, I didn't do it, you know. You know, not people in the state prison are claiming their innocence. And so, you know, you get a little bit jaded in this business after a while. And so I started looking at the videotapes with my jaded eye, and all of a sudden I realized that I actually had the real thing. I had a false confession case on my hands. People would like to believe that they would never confess to a crime they didn't commit short of being tortured. Most people would like to believe they wouldn't even confess under torture. 
People confess to things that they don't do when their own will is overborne by their interrogator. They make them feel so hopeless that the only thing they can do to save themselves is to confess, even if they didn't do it. And I just got that horrible pit in your stomach feeling like, oh my God, these kids are innocent, they're looking at life. What am I gonna do? One thing Mary Ellen Attridge did do was bring in Richard Afshi, a Pulitzer Prize winning expert in false confessions. <laughs> my reaction was that they ripped out Michael Crow's heart on camera. It was the most horrible interrogation I've ever watched because of what they did to that child. A Superior Court judge agrees. In December 1998, after Michael and his teenage co-defendants have been locked up for eight months, he throws out Michael's confession on the grounds that it was illegally obtained, psychologically coerced. But the judge does allow part of Josh's confession, the part with the most incriminating details. So the case will proceed to trial, with all three boys being tried for murder as adults on the strength of Josh's statement. I thought, okay, fine. You want to do it the hard way, I'll do it the hard way. If you want to let in the last confession, I'll bring all the other ones in and I'll show the jury where they came from. We will do this the long way. One month later, in January 1999, in the midst of jury selection for Josh's trial for murder, okay, um, there's a dramatic break in the case. Hard work and a hunch pay off for lawyer Mary Ellen Attridge. A year earlier, on the same night Stephanie was murdered, neighbors of the Crow family had complained to police about the intrusive behavior of a transient. Richard Raymond Tewitt, 28, was knocking on neighbors' doors looking for an old girlfriend. Tewitt was brought in for questioning. He had a history of mental illness and a conviction for car theft. He was briefly considered as a possible suspect. Police took his clothing and tested it, but they didn't find any blood evidence. Just as quickly, investigators dismissed to it as too mentally unstable to have silently carried out a murder in a house filled with people. Police let him go free. I'm still going with the detectives on this case, on their hunches, on what they did. However, where else do you get this Manson-like individual when I looked at that, I took two or three steps back. Police had held on to Richard to its clothing as evidence. Now, a year later, his red turtleneck catches the eye of the defense team. Our mouths were hanging open because the fact was is that when you looked at the shirt, you realized there was something on the shirt. You couldn't tell what it was. I couldn't look at the shirt and say, oh, that's a blood stain. But I did see a lot of staining on the shirt. Attridge demands this time that Tuitt's clothing be sent for DNA testing. After all, if these stains include blood, Stephanie Crow's blood, then Richard Tuitt might once again be a suspect. After weeks of waiting, the news is almost too good to be true. This was such a strong DNA result that you could rule out anybody who ever walked on the planet Earth as a donor of this blood, except Stephanie Crow. And Stephanie's blood on Tuitt's shirt seems set in a splatter pattern, one consistent with a violent stabbing. For Attridge, the results also prove that her defendants are innocent and that their confessions are false. I cried. I called my husband. I opened a bottle of champagne. I was like, that's it for me. <laughs> but that wasn't it. Not yet. Welcome to the Rick Roberts Show. The On the same day the case is dismissed, Southern Detective California Chris McDonough here. calls into this radio show to defend his role in the yeah, interrogation process. I did not wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, and sit down and say, you know what, today's the day I'm going to plant and frame Joshua Treadway for murder. Well, I don't uh, think that ridiculous. anybody... And, Detective and, McDonough, and, and I don't think anybody is saying that this is secondarily, born on top of, of that, hostility rather than stupidity. Finish, if I may finish... Secondarily, on top of that, videotape it at the same time. It's ridiculous. I am in a job to bring justice to that family, but I'm also in a job to bring justice to Mr. Tewitt if, in fact, he is not the perpetrator. Despite the fact that Stephanie Crow's blood was found on Richard Tewitt's shirt, a year later, he still has not been indicted for her murder. The investigation has been reassigned to the San Diego County Sheriff's Office and is still ongoing. And the reason you have not heard directly from the police or district attorney in this story 
is because they have refused to comment on this case since the families of the teenage defendants filed a federal lawsuit against them. The suit seeks compensation for the harm done to their sons by illegal interrogations and the resulting false confessions. But it is important to remember that the overwhelming majority of confessions police obtain every day in this country are fairly sought and freely given. Voluntary statements made by guilty people confessing to crimes they did commit. I hope false confessions are a very rare phenomenon. I hope that we would be talking about something that is one small fraction of one percent of the number of people who are convicted in this country in any given year. And even if it's that small, it's still a lot of people. I have had people confess who didn't do the crime. There was one case where we put a guy in for nine months who didn't do the murder. He felt that he, by stating that he was there and didn't do it, um, was going to be treated less harshly than if he did it. There are good cops. There are bad cops. There are also poorly trained cops. There are also cops who will step over the line to make a case knowing that they shouldn't do it, but do it anyway. And it was just, a, it was a bad case. And it happens. In Michael Crow's case, his entire interrogation was recorded on videotape. So a judge was able to see for himself how the teenager's confession of murder was illegally obtained. What if all police interrogations were videotaped? I think there's only one reason why police resist recording. They want to preserve the right to break the law when they feel they need to do it. I don't see any other reason not to tape record. No one believes detectives. No one believes police officers. I have been accused many times of beating confessions out of people. Take a look at the video. I have been accused of coercing people many times. Take a look at the video. Yet only two states, Alaska and Minnesota, legally require the videotaping of all interrogations, taping that often pays off in unexpected ways. We had one case where a man was accused of murder and he claimed to be blind in the interrogation room. So the police were asking him questions the entire time he maintained he was blind. And then the police went out of the room to get some coffee and he picked up the paper and started reading it the jury can see that. And so it really gives us an opportunity to deflect any accusations about police coercion or about a violation of constitutional rights. And it's done there right on tape. Stephanie Crow's parents remain convinced that Richard Tewitt killed their daughter. In February 1998,